How's it going everyone, and welcome to chapter 6 of the Story of New World, a series in which I'll go through the entire main story quest in the game and summarize it for you so you can experience all of the lore without having to redo the leveling process. If you're new to the series, there'll be links to the first chapter at the top right of the video and in the video description, so go back and start from the beginning so you can get caught up. Last time out, in chapter 5, I headed towards Everfall to find a man called Joki Khan, who taught me how to tame horses. With that knowledge, I managed to soul bond with a horse of my own, which I named Moonshadow. From there, I went on in search of an old man that was said to fish the East River, who I eventually met up with and learned his name was Jonas Alazar. Jonas spoke in riddles, but sent me to locations that could help me deal with my corruption problem. I learned about the mysterious group called the Soul Wardens, and found out that they were a group of honorable warriors who dedicated their lives to fending off the corruption. By going through old Soul Warden temples and reading their logs, I learned of their tragic fate. The silver lining was that through these texts, I managed to learn that Jonas, the man who was pointing me in the direction of these temples, was in fact the former commander of the Soul Wardens. His mind was in bad shape, and remembered very little of his past, but upon me informing him of what I found out, his memories began to flood back. He was sad to learn of what happened to his order, but we decided together we would rebuild the Soul Wardens, and I would join the order. To do this though, I would need to craft a powerful weapon that would be able to fight the corruption, and to do so, I would need a living seed, which would be no easy task to acquire, as the Angry Earth are no longer generous with giving them out. There was a mysterious huntress though that Jonas had heard of, who spoke on behalf of the Angry Earth. So if I was to get this seed, I would need to talk to her. So my plan was set. I was to head back to Oxborough to ask around about the location of this huntress, and then try to convince her to give me one of these living seeds. Now, let's get into chapter 6. But first, please consider giving the video a like and subscribe to the channel. It helps out massively. Chapter 6. The Huntress and the Azos Staff I headed off to Oxborough to ask around about this mysterious huntress Jonas told me about. I first spoke to a man called Odnell Lee, who sent me in the direction of a lady called Tekla Petrowski. She had heard about a huntress living in the woods, but dismissed the idea as just rumors and gossip. So from there, I headed off to a person I know that always knows all of the rumors and gossip, Grace O'Malley. She was staying at the inn in Oxborough, and sure enough, she had heard about this huntress. She said if anyone would know of her location, it would be the captain of the scouts, Frank Dubois. Grace was spot on. Frank knew of this lady, but laughed off all of the rumors of her being part animal or some kind of spirit. Instead, he said she was just a recluse, who made a shrine near the mines to the north of her home that she spends a lot of time at, so if I was to find her, I should look there. So with that information, I headed off in search of her. Frank's information was spot on, and I found the huntress at her shrine, but she did seem more than just a recluse from first glances. Her hair looked as if they were leaves from a tree, and horns grew out of her head unlike any human I'd seen before. She wasn't a very pleasant woman, and seemed very annoyed by my presence, but I pushed on in our conversation, determined to win her over, and ask for a living seed. Her hatred for humans ran deep, and it was clear I wouldn't be able to convince her with words alone. But I did catch on to something she said that might allow me to win her favor. She mentioned that this land needed a working Azoth fountain, and the one at her shrine seemed to be blocked by something. So I offered my services to get this fountain back working. She sent me to the caves nearby where the Azoth that feeds this fountain comes from to investigate what is blocking it. She promised that if I was successful, she'd at least hear me out. So I headed to the caves, which were swarming with corrupted. I slowly cleared out the area, defeating all of the corrupted with my fire staff. Once the area was clear, I headed back to the Huntress to see if what I did worked, and sure enough, the Azoth Fountain was running once again. When I informed her that it was corruption that was blocking the flow, she dismissed it, saying she'd investigate the matter herself. But a worried look came over her. Corruption wasn't supposed to be able to corrupt the Angry Earth, but if that had changed somehow, that would mean grave danger for them and everyone on Turnham. She followed through on her end of the bargain, and agreed to hear me out, but she warned me she had no sympathy for humans and their battle with corruption, as it's not their fight. So I figured I'd just get right down to it, and I told her I needed a living seed. The bluntness of my request made her laugh, before she went on to inform me how much it was that I was asking of her, and that the Angry Earth would want to know the truth, if I was going to use it to fight the corruption or not. I didn't want to lose her trust with the lie, so I told her the truth, that I planned to use it to make a weapon against the corruption. She was pleased with my honesty, and let me in on the secret behind why humans fall to corruption and the Angry Earth does not, and it was because corruption's power feeds the ego, mankind's greatest weakness. Angry Earth has no ego. She then generously gives me a recipe to create a potion that can help me fend off corruption, and sends me in the direction of where to get their ingredients. I went and gathered a bit of Azoth infused mist, some verdant petal cap, and a few engorged rivercrest stems, before returning to the Huntress to make the potion. This would surely be incredibly helpful to me in the fight against corruption. In the time I had been gone to gather the ingredients, the Huntress communed with the elements of the Angry Earth, but was still awaiting their answer. She was pleased with my sincerity and effort thus far, but believes it will require more to earn the trust of the Angry Earth. 
She goes on to explain that the Ebon Rock Caverns nearby are overrun with the Corrupted, and that they are a scourge on the land, so I should head over there and drive them away to earn more favor with the Angry Earth. I figured after she taught me how to make this nifty corruption potion, it was the least I could do. Plus, it would put a dent in the Corrupted, so I headed that way. There was a massive Corrupted camp set up around the caverns that took much effort to fight through. I figured I'd check out the command tent and then the feasting hall to see if there would be any indication as to why the Corrupted was here. Within the command tent, it seemed as if they were stockpiling weapons. I wondered what they had in mind for them. Either way, I dealt with the guard who was protecting them and headed on towards the feasting hall. The hall was massive and very well built. It made me wonder how these seemingly mindless creatures could build such a thing. But I cleared out the area, finding little to go on, so I figured I'd go directly into the cavern. As I entered the cavern, I was visited once again by the voice of corruption in my head, talking about the box Thorpe brought with us to the island, saying there was more power on this island to be had, and that she planned on finding it all. The corrupted all around the cavern seemed to be mindlessly mining away at the walls. Could they be searching here for a source of power like the box? After clearing out the corrupted mines, I made my way deeper into the cave and was shocked to see some kind of earthly looking creature trapped behind bars of corruption, being guarded by some kind of heavily armed corrupted creature. As I got closer, tendrils grew out of the ground and started attacking me. They were no match for my fire staff, but as I finished them off, the other corrupted creature lunged at me. He fought with a lot more ferocity than the tendrils, and took a tremendous amount of effort for me to defeat him, but eventually I did. After dealing with the corrupted, I climbed up the stairs to where the other creature was being held captive and set him free. Hopefully he was part of the angry earth and by freeing him, I could have earned some favor with them. He didn't say anything as he left, but he didn't try to attack me either, so that was a good sign. With the corruption crippled in this area, I decided to head back to the Huntress. Apparently, the creature I freed was one of her friends, and he informed the Huntress of what had occurred down in the mines. Inside the cavern was an angry earth shrine, and somehow, the corrupted had managed to find a way to corrupt it, which was very troubling for the Huntress to learn of. She was hoping this was just an anomaly, but either way, she needed to start taking precautions. She then hit me with the amazing news that my request for a living seed had been granted, but warns me, if we abuse the power of the living seed, the angry earth will visit their wrath upon us. Before we went our separate ways, she hit me with one more bombshell, telling me to give Jonas her regards, as she gives me a soul warden ring. I never once mentioned that I was working with Jonas. Plus, how did she get a soul warden ring? My mind wondered as I made my way back to Jonas on how this huntress knew so much about what we were doing, and if maybe she knew more about the soul wardens. She must do if she had one of their rings. Eventually though, I had returned to Jonas and informed him about everything that went down with the mysterious Huntress. He was pleased that I managed to get a living seed, but went on to inform me that this was just the first part we needed to make this weapon. Now we needed to get the other parts to be able to craft this staff. A staff that will draw on the power of my own soul to destroy corruption where it stands. So I went off in search of the components I needed, starting off with the haft. The trees from which they were once carved no longer grow on a turnum, but luckily enough, the soul wardens hid away some of these hafts as the days darkened, and an ancient ruin nearby, Canis, should have one of these halves within it. So I made my way there and entered the ruins. The ancients sure were impressive with their architecture and technology. To enter the ruins, I needed to jump into a large Azoth pool, and from there, things didn't get any easier. The whole area was full of deadly lasers and required perfect timing and agility to maneuver about. But I maneuvered my way through the temple and eventually found myself at the end, and found the cache holding the haft, just like Jonas mentioned. With the haft in my possession, I went after the next piece I needed, the consecrated cross piece. This would also be no easy feat, as all of the old ones had been melted down and turned into weapons during the last war. But the forge does still remain, so if I could find some of the scrap materials around the forge, I could use them to make a cross piece for myself. So I headed towards the forge, and sure enough, there was heaps of old unearthed silver all over. So I gathered up as much as I needed, and made my way to the forge entrance. The door was sealed shut, but the symbols above it seemed to correspond with, with the braziers below. So I figured the logical thing to do would be to light them in the correct order they appear in above the door, and hopefully, that would allow me to enter the forge. So I went ahead and did that, and thankfully, the door opened right up. As I entered the forge room though, a menacing looking creature stood guard of it, and began attacking me. It wielded a blacksmith hammer, leading me to believe this creature once was the master of this forge. Eventually, I dispatched of it, and with the help of its hammer, I used the forge to craft myself a consecrated cross piece. Upon returning to Jonas with it, he informed me that the creature I had to fight to gain access to the forge was called Forge Master Ezra, a man who ran the forge long ago, who must still remain there, keeping the forge hot, even after the light has left him. With all the components needed to build my weapon, Jonas informs me that I must hurry in its creation, as he met a traveler while I was away that told him that a large force of Corrupted is coming down from the north, led by the same voice that plagues my mind. Jonas was informed by this traveler that the Corrupted rally around something called the Tempest, 
a being they worship like a god. And if it's the same being that haunts me, I would need to move fast. So with that information in mind, it was time for me to forge my weapon, the Azoth Staff, and by doing so, bring back the Soul Warden Order. Jonas sends me off in the direction of the Shattered Obelisk, to find an ancient altar. If I put all the pieces I have gotten on this altar, they should fuse together into an Azoth Staff of my own. He did warn me though, doing this requires me to sacrifice a part of my soul. A troubling thought, but without this staff, surely I would fall to corruption sooner or later anyways, and eventually, the whole of Eternum would as well. So I was determined to get this done, and made my way to the temple. The temple was covered in undead creatures, that came at me every step of the way as I made my way to the altar. But eventually, I had cleared them all out, and found myself standing in front of the altar, ready to sacrifice a piece of my soul to get this Azoth staff finally made. As I placed all the pieces on the altar, they began to hover in place, and eventually fused together before being thrust back into my hand. I was filled with a strange sense of power when the Azoth staff first entered my hand, but I was brought back to reality when the Tempest's voice entered my head once again. He seemed angry that I now possess an Azoth staff, but assured me that wood and metal could still be broken. I didn't dwell on her words too long, as I made my way back to Jonas to show him my staff. He was shocked at how good I looked after the process, claiming most soul wardens come back at least a little pale afterwards. He believed maybe it was because I have extra soul to spare, whatever that means. While I was off creating the Azov staff, Jonas took time to think on our next move, and decided if we're going to succeed here, where the previous soul wardens failed, we need to rally some allies to our cause. So he sends me back to Oxborough to inform everyone of what's coming, and have them join us in fending off the coming corruption from the north. When I arrived in Oxborough, I figured my best bet would be to first speak to the magistrate, Balian Clark. He was of no help, however, not being worried by my warnings. Instead, he encouraged me to rest a while and spend some coin around Oxborough, something I had no intentions on doing. So from there, I headed on over to get Grace O'Malley's opinion on what I should do next. And she in turn sends me to talk to the constable, Avida Maesia, who is said to have come from the old Roman Empire centuries in the past. The constable was of little help as well, wanting to hear no talk of the corrupted. For what I could tell from scribbled notes left around her office, she was a bit mad in the head. She seemed to believe what was going on in her head was a punishment for betraying the Legion and fleeing Brimstone for Everfall, but maybe it was the corruption's doing. Best I stay clear of her. Instead, I went to the only person that seems to be of any help in this town, the Captain of the Guard, Frank Dubois. He was the only person who took my warnings seriously, and went on to inform me he'd been trying to warn everyone in the city about the corrupted as well, but no one will listen. He has little hope, but when I inform him about my Azov staff, a weapon that can fight the corruption, he seems to light up. He's a bit skeptical though of my claims, thinking the timing is too perfect. He thinks I'm trying to trick him, so in order to prove to him the power my Azoth staff has, I headed out to the farms just north of Oxborough to dispatch the corrupted who have taken over there. It was more work than I expected dealing with the corruption at the farm. I've never seen an area so consumed by corruption, but just like Jonas promised, my Azoth staff was able to destroy the corruption and slowly but surely I whittled down the corrupted forces in the area. Eventually, once I had thinned out the herd, I decided it was time to find the source of this massive corruption spike, so I headed towards the houses that had been covered in corruption. As I made my way to the houses, I knew I was on the right track, as the Tempest visited me once again in my mind. At the same time, I could see some massive terrifying creature off in the distance, unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It had razor sharp claws, needle like teeth, and monumental horns coming out from the sides of its head. It charged me immediately, and began attacking me mercilessly. It took everything I had in me to evade this monster's attacks, and eventually, after what felt like an eternity, I managed to deal the finishing blow to the creature. A massive explosion of corruption exited his body as it was defeated. Seeing such a fearsome creature under the control of the corruption made me really worried about the fight ahead. If we weren't able to gather allies quickly, Jonas and I alone would not be able to stop this immense threat. I had to focus on the matter at hand though, so I went to the colossal mountain of corruption that was being guarded by the monster and put my Azoth staff forward putting an end to its hold over these farms. As the corruption faded away from the area, I was once again visited by the Tempest. She tried to convince me to join them, which only grew my confidence in the work we were doing, as she must be getting worried we might actually be able to stop her. I headed on back to regroup with Jonas, who was glad to see my Azoth staff was working. He did mention, however, that there was still one thing I needed to do before I could be anointed as Soul Warden, and that was to acquire a heart gem. He went on to explain, a heart gem is a vessel that I'd be able to use to encase my soul, protecting it from corruption, and the only place to get one was inside a cold vault in the earth beneath the Amran Temple. So I headed off towards the Amran Temple to get my excavation underway, so I could get myself one of these heart gems. But that brings an end to chapter 6, I hope you enjoyed it. If you're liking the series so far, please consider giving the video a like, it helps out massively. And also, why not subscribe to the channel with notifications on so you'll know when the next episode is uploaded. But until next time...
Have a good one. Thanks for watching another video. If you'd like to watch the next chapter, chapter 7, if it's available, click on the video to the left. Or, if you'd like to see some of the best New World content creators face off in a transmog contest I hosted, click on the video to the right.